and uh, we will not waste valuable time to uh, get into details. But uh, I would start by uh, welcoming and uh, conveying my respects to uh, His Holiness Radharad Swamiji. Uh, he is uh, one of the tallest and most eminent spiritual leaders of the world at the moment. And uh, he was a direct disciple of Srila Prabhupada and has an amazing life journey, which he has encapsulated in two of his best-selling books. Apart from being a spiritual leader, he is an institution builder. And uh, one organization that he has built, we saw the video, Annamitra Foundation, which is uh, serving meals to the needy. And at the moment, it has achieved a lot of salience given the COVID situation. And he's also uh, the brain and the spirit behind the Govardhan Eco Village experiment outside Mumbai, which is again uh, getting a lot of uh, attention uh, as far as alternate education is concerned. Uh, Swamiji, Pranam, welcome to this event. We also have Dr. Ajay Piramal. Uh, he is one of India's most eminent uh, business persons, industrialist, philanthropist. He is behind many institutions. He is well known uh, over the, all over the world. And uh, uh, Ajayji, your organizations and, and companies are very active even in the United States. And uh, I had the opportunity of knowing some of your CEOs. And you are really one of the most eminent uh, Indian corporates. And uh, the kind of investments you have made in the United States is a huge building block uh, in the Indo-US relationship. So I thank you for that. And thanks for uh, joining us. And I must say personally, I, am a, I have a soft corner for nature and environment. And I find uh, the Piramal Sarvajal initiative uh, to, to be my favorite. And the kind of work you are doing in the 121 aspirational districts, I think that is really a, a trailblazer and, and, and breaking new path for corporate India. Thank you for, for joining us. We have uh, Dr. Reddy. Uh, amongst uh, various hats that she wears, uh, she is a medical professional. She runs India's most premium uh, health brand, if I may say so, and is also now uh, leading the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. And uh, she has, again, many hats, like all our panelists, and she is a philanthropist. She is behind many initiatives, and we just now heard about what uh, Dr. Reddy is doing to fight the, the corona pandemic. We also have with us uh, uh, a direct descendant of Henry Ford. We've all read about Henry Ford. He is, he is one of the first, uh, I would say, the corporates and his and he's well known all over the world. But uh, um, Alfred, uh, your uh, contribution to, to uh, building Indo-US relationships, to building uh, uh, cor corporates with, with uh, soft heart, and also your your contributions to uh, to spirituality are well known and well recognized, and we are delighted that you could join us today in this panel. Uh, before I hand over to uh, to Sumit, I was uh, thinking about what to say, and uh, something was there in the back of my mind about um, about our um, holy scriptures uh, and uh, Upanishad, and and I, I uh, suddenly recollected that once Gandhi was asked you know, uh, the essence of Hinduism. And uh, he said that, you know, if all the Upanishads and all our scriptures and everything is lost, uh, but only if the first verse of the Isha Upanishad remains, then Hindus or the Indic followers of the Indic civilization, they will be able to find their moorings in this world. So I just uh, went into uh, the little bit of depth of what Gandhiji has said. And uh, he said that, um, uh, the, 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 the phrase he quoted or the verse that he quoted from the Isha Upanishad goes like this. Isavasyam idam sarvam yadkincha jagatyam jagat tena taktena bhunjita magrat kasya aviddhanam. Essentially, it means that uh, everything in this world is controlled by the Lord and everything in the world it belongs to Him. He has set apart what is appropriate for you. So use just that much and do not covet other people's wealth. So I think this is essentially the, uh, the, the distillation of our, our philosophy. And you know, if, we, if we can lead our lives according to this philosophy or if corporates can inculcate uh, this in their corporate philosophy, and then I think the purpose of business becomes uh, more, more, more valid and more, more salient. 
I was also going through uh, the roundtable, uh, the business roundtable, which has come out uh, with its uh, with with its philosophy of the purpose of business. I I loved it. I I agree to all of that. But I found uh, Mr. Ganguly and Mr. Piramal one element missing in that. I will read it out. The statement of purpose of business of corporation says it is delivering value to our customers, investing in our employees, dealing fairly and ethically with our suppliers supporting the communities in which we work, generating long-term value for shareholders. This used to be, uh, according to Friedman, the only purpose of corporation. So in the last 50, 60 years, we have gone ahead and committed to transparency and effective management with shareholders, engagement with shareholders. But unfortunately, I find uh, uh, the spiritual and the and natural dimension missing in this. You know, we cannot do business by hurting the environment. We cannot... Uh, do business by by damaging, uh, polluting the sky or uh, the air or polluting the rivers. So I think somehow that element, I don't know if it is ingrained in the other uh, pillars of the purpose, but that somehow uh, learning is missing. So uh, my uh, question to to uh, uh, Dr. Piramal and Dr. Redby to, uh, would be to how do corporates address that element? Because now in the COVID times when we are in the lockdown, uh, we see the environment bouncing back. So uh, that's that really has gladdened the heart, but that of course cannot be uh, the way forward. So we have to find a way where the environment is protected and our businesses also do well. So with these initial remarks, uh, Mr. Ganguly, in fact, you are also on the way to becoming a doctor. I believe you are pursuing a PhD. So uh, still that time, uh, we call you doctor. It's it's over to you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you so very much again. And uh, without wasting too much time, I'll ask uh, Dr. Piramal the first question. Uh, and this is a really question to all of you. Uh, during this crisis, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And how as an organization leader are you running? So these are really extraordinary times. I mean, none of us and even our forefathers have not seen such a time before. So. Everything is that you're really being on the run and looking at how to adapt to the situation. But one thing has remained constant, and that is the purpose that we have. A few years ago, we decided on what is the purpose of our business and of everything that we do. In some ways, it's really a purpose that each individual can also incorporate in their own lives. That's what we felt. And so the, our purpose is doing well and doing good and making a positive difference to the world around us by living our values. So what we mean is that we have to do whatever we do, we have to do it well and we have to do it and it should also serve a good purpose. And it's not only in our business, which have to do well and it should do good, but even in our philanthropic activities, they must, they will do good, but they must also do it well. So that's important. And serving people, the seva bhav is very important for us. That's what we've learned actually from uh, Radha Nath uh, Maharaj. And then living our values. And our values talk about the main thing in our values is knowledge, action, care, and impact. And also the concept of trusteeship. How we are trustees to whether it is our customers, our employees, our shareholders, and society. So in this period, how are we living uh, and going by our purpose is important. And it's important to understand that in purpose, you have to do well. So in a business, very often people say that, should you make profits? According to us, profit is important because it is the oxygen which lets you survive and go. But that's not the only purpose why you live for oxygen. You want to also live well. But today we have to ensure that our businesses do well so that we can also do good, not only in the business, but beyond business. So in our business, let me give you the example. We are in pharmaceuticals. So today through uh, all efforts and we have uh, plants all over the world, whether it's in uh, India, North America, in the US, Canada, UK, so how do we ensure, and these plants make essential goods, uh, essential uh, pharmaceuticals, inhalation anesthesia products, which are important for 
uh, in this critical period. So how do we see that we run these plants, that we uh, run the supply chain? How do we ensure that our workers are safe and these products are delivered? So that is one exercise we do. We are also in, a, we make glass packaging for pharmaceuticals and the glass vials that we make go into uh, uh, supplying vaccine uh, to fill in vaccines. So again, how do we see that these plants, and they are in the US, they are in India, how do they work in the same issues of pharmaceuticals? But besides this, what is our uh, contribution to society? Uh, you spoke about Anamrit and the, uh, all the initiative which was started by Radhanath Maharaj. So uh, I was seeing some of the slides that came off Anamrit before we started. Actually, those are dated. Till now we have, I was just seeing the latest uh, numbers supplied 15 million meals in the last 56 days. And these are really for the migrant labor, people who are in uh, you know, slums and they were contained and there's no, air, uh, there's no way to get food. And you know how critical that is. So Anamrit has been doing a great job. Besides that, uh, recently we've just launched a campaign, which is again with uh, Niti Aayog of the government of India, that in the aspirational districts, 25 of them, aspirational districts in India, the prime minister identified were the ones which were the most backward in some ways and needed to be really looked after. And in this, we found we've started a new campaign, which is called the Dada Dadi Nana Nani campaign, where people, volunteers, and in the 25 districts till now, we've got 25,000 volunteers who are working with our teams of people to contact the Dada Dadis and the aged people, people above the age of 60, as you know, they are the most vulnerable to any disease. And many of them are alone and they don't know they don't have anybody to talk to. So in this, uh, it's just started two weeks ago, but uh, we've been having 200,000 calls on that already and 50,000 beneficiaries. And I think uh, the Niti Aayog and the government is so happy with the impact. So it's making a big, a big difference to uh, these older people. Even if you talk to them for a few minutes, you'll, you know how difficult it is sometimes when you're lonely and the stress is. So again, uh, I think uh, they would like to spread it to the other districts of the country as well. So that's one of the initiatives. Uh, besides that, we have a health helpline, which is now served. I think uh, the number is almost 400,000 callers all over the country. Again, issues of concerns on COVID and uh, any other health issues in the last, uh, since this uh, COVID issue has come up. Lovely. Uh, I can so, go on. I know. No, we will come back to you. I wanted to hear, of course, Dr. Reddy, you're in midst of it. So uh, it's an experience and an existential experience. So how are you dealing with it? What is it that you're thinking? First, let me, you know, say namaste and thank you. I think um, I'm very happy and privileged to be here among such great leaders. But I also think that I want to thank Atap for uh, conceiving this type of concept and ideology because it is so important for us um, in COVID times, but in continuous times that we evolve who we are as individuals, who we are as a society, a more caring, inclusive society. And because corporations are so important as the fabric of uh, society, that corporations redefine the purpose and they go from what was referred to earlier by Sandeep Ji uh, as shareholder return to really all stakeholder return and then become even more inclusive in their uh, definition of the purpose of their existence uh, to encompass society, mankind, concepts of Vasudeva Kutumbakam and then move on to the environment itself. So I, th I think that at the core of everything that we do, um, it's been a crazily hectic time. I cannot you know, even reiterate all the things we've been juggling, whether it was in medical readiness or the impact on business and what Fiki has been trying to do. But I think still it's given time and created a kind of a, a compulsion to introspect. 
And at the core of that compulsion is really, what are we going to do different at the end of this? And I, I think by the end of your one hour, we will be talking about that. So let me quickly come back to your question, which is what have you done? Or what has your organization done? First, I really want to say that, you know, this, this is a war, but it's a war without guns. It's a war without bullets, without soldiers, without borders, without ceasefire agreements. And I think the Ugandan president said that, and there are no sacred zones as well. Uh, like Ajay Ji rightly said, the oldest the most, are the most vulnerable. So there's no sacred zone. But I, I think that collective knowledge and science has thankfully showed us that this army has a weakness. And this weakness capitulates in the face of collective social and physical distancing. It bows before personal hygiene and it helps you take your destiny in your own hands just by keeping them sanitized. And if in the midst of this emergency, we practice that this service and this urgency and this love for others. So, you know, things like um, I've left my family and I'm working in the hospital, so please stay at home for me. It's about messages like that, which have come out from the healthcare workers. It's public response to that, which I think showed such a great compliance to the lockdowns. So I think somewhere in the middle of all this, it is evoking a new kind of response from humanity. And it's very important for all of us to uh, kind of make sure that some of these lessons learned are not forgotten. But very quickly, uh, what we did for COVID was number one, being a healthcare group, and we work across hospitals, across you know rural and urban. We work in in small communities. We have clinics. We have IT. So first, we you know said let us use IT. So our app, which is an AI-enabled risk score, has had over 18 million people take the risk scoring. We scaled up our clinics to create fever clinics, so people had a safe place to go. We ramped up our testing capabilities, so we're testing across based on ICMR guidelines. We were part of the think tanks, which helped, uh, you know, work with the government, work with private sector. So we were formulating policy as we were implementing and executing. We created guidelines for our own hospital, but then we didn't keep it just with us. Whether it was, you know, temperature scanning, what do you do in theater? How do you manage an emergency? If a cardiac patient comes in, you have to treat them. But if he's at risk, how do you get your doctors to come in? How do you bring protective gear? So these guidelines were actually shared uh, across. We used, I mean, the healthcare committee of FICI, but also CII, uh, Nursing Homes Association, we shared those guidelines. Then when it came to lifting the lockdown, we gave out guidelines to corporations. What do you do for life after lockdown? Endless number of training programs, protocols, methodologies to reduce the fear and I kept telling people, be cautious, but not anxious. So a series of initiatives, and of course, most importantly, what we, we have to do is the beds. So we identified separate isolated buildings or wings where there was no uh, connection with our other patients. So we kept our patients safe, but these beds are almost 650 beds operating today across the country with an ability to scale this up to over a thousand beds. We worked with manufacturers for ventilators, for innovation, small health, self-health care groups, our own rural initiative where women are now stitching PPs. So scaling up and literally use every capability you have to help together uh, fight this pandemic was really the, the mantra that we've been applying over the last few days uh, towards this. And uh, I just want to say that you know, the mission that um, our founder and my father gave us almost 38 years ago uh, remains valid even today. And it's about, you know, bringing uh, healthcare within the reach of everyone, whatever the call for that healthcare may be. 38 years ago, it was advanced bypass surgery. Today, it's about fighting the corona. So whatever is it, give that response to people. And most importantly, it's a very simple thing that the Apollo family and our team is family. So the Apollo family of 80,000 people are all committed towards this goal. And our single motto is really, how do we go out and touch lives nice. and, nice. and reach out? And that's that's what we've been trying to do over the last few days, besides, of course, in FIKI, working with various governments. And I know that, yes. you know, they've done an amazing job in terms of policy and response and, you know, bridging the gap between uh, what is perceived to be what is needed to what is actually needed on the ground. And I, and I think that voice and that bridge uh, was quite important. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah. This is for you, Maharaj. Uh, in terms with what Dr. Piramal was saying, and he's also from Harvard Business School. Harvard Business School talks about doing good business decently. And what we heard from uh, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Piramal is very much in those lines. How would you advise us to address this, what we're experiencing, and how do we find meaning from this? Thank you. I'm very grateful, very honored, and very happy to be among all of you. Thank you, our honorable Counselor General Sandeep Chakravarti G for organizing this wonderful event. And to Sumit and to Sangeeta and to Ajay and to um, Alfred Ford. Um, there was a great saint from Bengal. His name was Bhaktivinoda Thakur. He lived at the latter part of the 19th century and early 20th. And he was, he had a family of 10 children. He was a magistrate in the government. Um, he was a person who really harmonized his occupational career with his inner spiritual purpose. And although he was such a incredibly gifted talented um, magistrate. He was such an exemplary um, person for society. Even Babaji's and Sadhus and Swamis would come to receive his blessings and his teachings. Um, he wrote many books, he composed beautiful songs and in one of these songs, he writes, where there's the greatest need, there's the greatest opportunity to serve. We can see everything according to the foundational purpose of our life. And it's interesting to see throughout the ages, throughout the world, the greatest messages and inspirations have come at the time of crisis. In the Christian and Islamic religions, their foundation is dealing with persecution. The literatures of the Baha'i Temple began being written in prisons. Lord Buddha, he was in the greatest existential crisis of his life when he was seeking truth. And then we have the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita was spoken by Krishna to Arjuna at the time of the greatest crisis between two armies at the beginning of the greatest war the world has ever seen. Arjuna understood the necessity, not only of hearing knowledge, but of applying it to his life. And Arjuna, he had a family and he had an occupation. He prepared, he studied under the school of Dronacharya and he learned his trade to the best of his capacity. And when it came time to actually engage in his occupation, he did it with his full heart. He wasn't a coward, he was humble because what he learned in Bhagavad Gita is that nothing is ours. As our beloved Ajay Piramal has already explained, 
We are not proprietors, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. We are caretakers of sacred property. Whatever intelligence, whatever skills, whatever influence, whatever resources we have, we are entrusted these things to utilize them to our best capabilities for the pleasure of God in the service of humanity and ultimately all living beings. In whatever situation we're in, it may be prosperity and it may be crisis. The question that we're taught to ask is how could I best serve? How could I best make a positive difference physically, emotionally, and spiritually in people's lives? And Ananda Mayobhyasha, the real fulfillment that the heart is seeking is love, to love and be loved. And that love, we connect to it through seva, through service. So in business, it's a wonderful opportunity. Whether we're like Hanuman, building the bridge by carrying huge mountains, or that little spider who was just kicking one grain of sand at a time to build that bridge. Lord Ram, Sam Haditoshanam, he explained that you are both doing equal because you are both doing according to your capacity for the higher good, for a spiritual moral purpose. And perhaps the greatest need in the world today is for business to be conducted with character, with integrity. And ultimately, character and integrity are built on a foundation of compassion. Nice. And we have with us today, we have people in business, people in politics, people in medicine, people in academics, and we're all harmonized for one purpose, to actually serve to the best of our capacity, capacity individually and collectively. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, I'll also refer to Dr. Piramal, what you talked about knowledge, action, compassion. Uh, as uh, Council General said, I'm kind of being a little adventurous and pursuing a doctorate program. So I get to read a little scholarly report. What is exciting is they're talking about wisdom as a three-dimensional scale. Cognitive wisdom, which is jnana, or reflective wisdom, where we experience. And then there is effective wisdom, which is wisdom which is laced with compassion. I couldn't believe it that in a scholarly report, uh, from Yale and others, they're talking about wisdom laced with compassion and forgiveness. And that will have lasting and direct benefit to an organizational upliftment. Fascinating. So I'll come to uh, Mr. Ford. Would love to know about your life. How, from being a scion of the family that represented American chutzpah and entrepreneurship to embracing a culture, a culture of altruism. How did this all come about, sir? Well, what many people don't know is that Henry Ford's life basically ran on two tracks. One was as a business genius, and the other one was as a spiritual inquirer. So I, I more or less followed that side of it, <laughs> where he wanted to know about you know, he believed in reincarnation. He was a vegetarian. Uh, he had an Indian Sufi come and visit him in Detroit once. Uh, he used to hand out pamphlets on reincarnation to people who went through the factory. Wow. So I more or less followed in that side of him. And our family has always had one foot in the business world and one foot in the philanthropic world. So, you know, my grandfather, Edsel, and his father, Henry, they, 
They founded the Ford Foundation in the 1950s. And of course, they've been doing wonderful work all around the world. And I was brought up in a very generous philanthropic uh, family. My parents were both great philanthropists. And we were taught when we were growing up uh, that axiom that uh, to, to whom much has been given, much is expected. So we had everything and everything was always given to me. So I, the only thing I didn't have was a purpose, was wisdom. And, and that's what we're talking about. I did not have any wisdom. I grew up, I went to boarding school, I went to college. And still, it was the 1960s. Nobody really knew what was going on. But then I met uh, my spiritual master, uh, Prabhupada, and read the Bhagavad Gita as it is. And immediately, a light came on. And uh, it gave me a purpose in life. And it gave me wisdom, you know, so I could, I could uh, you know, use that wisdom in uh, creating a path for myself. So I more or less, you know, I feel a little bit out of place on this panel because I more or less stepped away from anything corporate or whatever. I used to involve myself with the Ford Fund and the various charitable organizations of Ford Motor Company. But uh, I've been busy in West Bengal for the last couple of years and I, I'm married to a, a Bengali, so, <laughs> so uh, Sharmila Bhattacharya. So we've been spending a lot of time over in India. And unfortunately with this lockdown, you know, we can't travel as much as we used to, but uh, you know, things are going along fine over there even after the uh, cyclone. So, you know, we've been, we've been working with the, the entities in India to try to give some comfort to the people that live in, around Mayapur and in Mayapur. So that's been very important. And, uh, you know, as you may have read about, Ford Motor Company has jumped into the, the battle uh, with COVID uh, with both feet. And this is a, there's a long history of Ford doing that. In the Second World War, they turned their factories into making bombers uh, that flew to Europe and helped uh, win the victory in Europe. So they're very practiced at utilizing their uh, their facilities to serve whatever the present need is and at the time at the time a few weeks ago there was a real need for ventilators and protective gear and everything so Ford went full steam into providing that manufacturing that and did such a good job we had the president of the United States uh, come to the Ford factory a few days ago and congratulate everybody and uh, Ford is also in the front. My cousin Bill, who's the chairman, is a very, very fervent uh, environmentalist and he has been all his life. So it's just not a fad. He's actually committed to this. So, you know, he's committed to creating very safe and uh, clean vehicles, you know, because people need vehicles. I mean, I tell you, I appreciate, especially in this, pandemic. I really am appreciating the car that I'm driving and it has the air you can filter and everything. You feel like you're in a bubble, very safe. So, so uh, you know, we're doing what we can as far as, but we're locked down here. We're in Gainesville. We have a big community of devotees, but we're all taking care of each other and we do what we can as far as working through the corporation to help people around the country. And I'm doing what I can to help people over in India. And I'm hoping that I can get back to my work soon because the whole purpose of this temple that we're building in Mayapur is to provide wisdom to people, yes. you know, from the Vedas, from the Vedic literature. So I'm very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one of the key initiatives, one of the many initiatives that uh, Maharaj Radhanath Swami has been involved in uh, Dr. Piraman has been involved in is Anamrita. As you said, Mr. Pir Dr. Piraman, you did, did catch us. It was, we had written 7 million, but you've actually fed uh, through Anamrita and through Maharaj's blessings, almost 15 million displaced migrant workers. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of them are kind of working based on that message. So if you'll allow me, I'll request Anindo to show that for a minute. And then I want to come back to you, Dr. Piraman. I'll put that on. Is this visible? 
Yes, please yes. please. difficult times of a national lockdown where almost everyone is in a state of confusion and hopelessness not knowing what to expect in the future amid such turbulent situations a namrit foundation rises to the occasion and braces itself to fight the war of hunger Thank you, Anindo. Thank you. We did correct it in this one, uh, uh, Dr. Piraman. <laughs> so, Dr. Piraman, one thing that uh, I was thinking of that whenever we see all of you uh, in business, we kind of associate success, glamour, glitz with you and all. But all of you have had adversity and strong uh, uh, issues that has shaped you, and I was fascinated to read. uh some of the adversities you went through and you were kind enough to allow me to even ask you this question sir uh would you talk to the people about that a little bit please so first i'll just make one comment you talked about our values of knowledge action and care actually the origin of that is from the gita knowledge is gyan action is karm and bhakti So it's a, a combination of gyan, karma, and bhakti. So I thought I'd just add that to you. So all the inspiration, the wisdom, is what uh, Radhanath Maharaj has given us by explaining the Gita to us. So we are. And the acronym with I becomes Kashi, as holy as it can be. <laughs> so yes. Uh, talking of adversity you know a lot of people think that one went through a lot of adversity but when i look back i think that uh, it was really again to use uh, what uh, uh, <clears throat> maharaj said it was really uh, these challenges are a way to give you opportunities but come as it may it was in uh, new york actually when i was uh, 24 years old and it was uh, my father we had come here for a check up in those days you didn't have ct scans i'm talking of 79 and uh, within 30 seconds he passed away in a hotel and when i was there so you know and that time i was 24 so that itself was a big shock because i was very close to my father but be it that as may my elder brother and me we were in business uh, together and again my elder brother uh, at the age of 33 uh, he was a very fit person you know he just won a tennis tournament a uh, couple of uh, weeks ago and then suddenly was detected with cancer uh, and uh, again we came back to new york but in a year's time he passed away so he was 34 uh to add to all this uh the uh, my in 1982 in our business we had the longest textile strike in the world where every textile mill in uh, mumbai was uh, uh, the workers struck work for 18 months so you can imagine that was our business and it went uh, through a very very challenging time as you can imagine and uh, i mean it was really going into almost liquidation if i may say 
And it was at the same time that my brother developed his cancer. So here I was uh, at, my fa at my brother's death, looking at uh, there was no business. My brother had passed away. His young wife and his three kids, eldest was uh, 10, 11 years old, and the youngest was two years old and to manage them and my mother. But you know, when I think, look back now, it's not, it was, I mean, everybody says it was a big challenge, but I think it's gone by. And I believe very, very, I really believe it was not anything that I could do, but there was some blessing that I had. There was a much bigger power that helped me. And it's, I think that was an opportunity because of the challenges that we had in the textile industry we went into a new business, which was pharmaceuticals. And that did well for us. If it had not been a challenge, if it was an average business, we would have just continued to remain there. So I think that was an opportunity. The other thing is, I think it just strengthened my faith. So today it is a challenging time to be in business. I mean, it's not easy, but I believe that if there was that, uh, that power that could uh, help you through at those times, that power is still there. We have to just invoke it. The sun is there. We have to just go out into the sunshine to see that we get that. So that's the opportunity, I think. Very, very, very. very. This is a question for you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, Simon Sinek talks about that we often focus on the how and the what, but I think the important business imperative or driver would be the why. Uh, if you agree, and I know you do, and how do you practice it and personify that within a portal? So I think the why is really the driving purpose of why we exist. Because, you know, uh, in 1983, uh, Apollo began or was inspired uh, really because my father who was a practicing cardiologist who had returned from the US. Um, and Mr. Ford, our, our prized possession was a Lincoln Continental car, <laughs> which he brought back. So, you know, he returned from the US with a car and four young daughters that we were too young to protest about being brought back to India because uh, his father told him that I'm so happy with everything you do in the US, but imagine if you could do that in India and just that one line and he packed his bags. But when he came here, he set up a clinic, which was at that time the best ever, but um, there was no credible heart surgery program. Like I just said, there was no CT scan. We, we bought India's first CT scan. But he was, you know, really inspired because he lost a young man at the age of 42 who left behind a young wife, 38 years old, and two young children. And he said, how many more Indians must die? And he had saved him of a heart attack. But by the time he raised the $100,000 required for heart surgery and got his visa, he succumbed to a second attack and died. And that's when he said we must create the infrastructure to enable people to have care in India. And so the purpose was really to enable people to access health care. And then after that, everything we, we did was only towards that. We started, you know, one of the country's largest pharmacy chains so that people didn't need to travel all the way in the middle of the night to come to our hospital to get credible, safe medicines. Uh, we started nursing schools because there were no good nurses. We did a medical college because we need, wanted to improve medical education. So I think it's about why, and that why is, you know, how can you create better healthcare for people? And that was really dad's uh, complete inspiration. And being the kind of person he is, um, I think organizations sometimes uh, grow and you know, and, and are managed by, by fear and control and scarcity and competition. But if you build an organization which is uh, centered around inspiration and purpose, it completely changes the way your entire team works. And that's why, you know, over the last 36 years that I've been working, I'm inspired because of what we get to do every day. And, and Swami said it so beautifully that we've been given the opportunity to serve and we feel blessed to have that opportunity. And now uh, our, our father and chairman is focusing us on how do we put a focus on preventive healthcare and proactive care so that less people get sick. Because in India, 
you know, when you see a heart patient, it's 70% of them have three and four vessels blocked. And you wonder where were they when the first vessel got blocked? And when you see cancer patients, 65% of cancer in India reaches at stage three and stage four and beyond. So why aren't we doing preventive screening and catching them when it's you know early and finding ways? So that's what we're now extensively focusing on besides education. So it's really all about the why. How do we make the world a healthier, happy place? And how do we enable access to those who get sick, enable access to the advanced care that they need? So whether we did you know, health insurance, our rural screening programs, everything is towards those, those single purposes. It is all about the why. And then they're very smart people in our across the world. And they figure out how to do the best of how. Uh, as long as you keep everybody committed to the passion and the purpose. Very nice. Uh, if I seem a little underprepared for this uh, uh, seminar no. or webinar, I'll tell you, there is someone to blame. Yesterday evening, with all good intentions, I go to www.radhanathswami.com and I see one video, then I say second video. <laughs> and suddenly, after four hours, I have nothing much to prepare. So I tell, uh, it's, I would really uh, recommend everyone to visit, especially the Princeton East meets West uh, with Dr. Cornell West. Radhana Swami, your uh, homespun homilies and the way you present, uh, it's very emotional. And even now, I was losing my train of thoughts when I was listening to you. So tell us more about wisdom and how as business people, we could anchor ourselves and reconcile to the short-term expediency with the long-term tenets of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you. Wisdom is knowledge that's built upon the foundation of practical experience. The Brahma Sutra begins, Atato Brahma, Brahma Jigyasa, <clears throat> that the essential purpose of human life is self-realization, to understand who am I? When we understand who we really are, then we interact with the world in such a way that we're offering the greatest benefit for the highest purpose. Dehi no sminyata dehi, that we are not this body, we are the eternal soul, the living force, the person that's experiencing life through the body and through the mind. <clears throat> and the nature of the soul is beyond birth, beyond death, nahanyate hanyamane saride, and we're part of God. We're part of the supreme being. Aham bija pratapita, Krishna tells in Gita, that the Lord is the eternal father and mother for all beings. Therefore, we are eternally loving servants of the Supreme. And when we understand that principle, we apply it to every aspect of our life. That my beloved Guru Srila Prabhupada, he once said, that philosophy without good character is practically useless. The whole purpose of knowledge is to transform our values and how we live within this world. Time is constantly with us. For the body, Death is inevitable. Within our life, how we can share with our family, with the world, and the legacy that we leave behind 
It's the greatness of our life. Srila Prabhupada said, the greatness of a person is estimated by how we tolerate very difficult situations. If a storm comes, unless our house has a strong foundation, it will crumble. The storms that come in life, when we <laughs> interpret them from the perspective of our true nature, our true identity as eternal souls, as parts of God, then we understand that every living being is my brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and all of the environment is the sacred property of the Supreme that we are all sharing together. So we have a responsibility to live in harmony with our true nature. Business is so much affecting every aspect of life. And as it has been said by Mr. Piramo, the more we're given, the more responsibility <coughs> we have to actually live with the legacy of character, integrity, and ultimately compassion and devotion to God. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Uh, if you'll allow me, uh, Jonas Salk, since we are all kind of racing for the vaccine, Jonas Salk in the survival of the wisest had said that wisdom is the practical value for human survival and for the maintenance and enhancement for the quality of life. So very often when we talk about wisdom and business as two dichotomous chambers, I think it's important that we conflate them. And I think we base our business on wisdom. And some of the initiatives that Radhanath Maharaj have shown us in terms of altruism and serving uh, becomes all the more important during this crisis. Uh, we will come very close to the end and we'll invite uh, Mr. Ford to say a few words and then I'll pass it on to Council General for the vote of thanks and some recap of today's uh, learnings. Mr. Ford. Uh, I'm just very happy to be part of this discussion and uh, it's so important now to share ideas now that we're all locked down and we can't run around like crazy people the way we usually do. So uh, I think it's it's very wonderful. I'm so impressed with all of you, all of the participants and all the activities they were doing. And uh, you know, I, I just I think that ultimately, as many have said on this panel, that ultimately this lockdown, it, it, you know, aside from the people that have died and have lost their jobs, which is a tragedy, but uh, there is probably a silver lining that will come out of this on the other side. And somebody mentioned the environment, you know, uh, it's coming back so strongly these days because it's not being constantly polluted. So there are many bright sides to this. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, we'll be able to sort things out uh, as long as we don't have or expect instant answers. So uh, my best to everybody on the panel. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate and my best to all of you. How do you Thank share? you. Mm -hmm. uh, before you go ahead, uh, Mr. Chakraborty, wanted to add that some of my friends and colleagues uh, have really played the most important role here. Uh, Rajiv Srivastava, uh, who is a true karma yogi and an inspiration. Uh, he uh, is a part of Basel Partners. He's created the private equity in the name of Tulsi. Uh, we have Sanjeev Maheshwari. Uh, we have Sunil Sanghai. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Kushal Desai of Apar Industries. And all of them have really created this Artha Forum and the idea is not to just wait to reach the level of Dr. Reddy or Dr. Piramal to explore altruism and serve. But if as a society, we can integrate that along with your family, if you can expand the family, definition of family, 
And whatever we do, we do that for a slightly larger expanded family. We will always not wait for the be a recipient of the largest of the government, but the business comes together. And with that, I'll hand this over to Council General. And thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Ganguly. I think uh, uh, the choice of the name for Artha Forum is very appropriate. It's a double meaning word, which is also money and finance, but also Arth which is meaning. So I think uh, it's a very appropriate uh, you know, platform for bringing together uh, such eminent people. I was, um, uh, I was uh, before I thank uh, uh, Swamiji, I would like to say that Swamiji, there is something uh, in, in, in this Zoom technology, that moment uh, uh, you came on, uh, we started feeling some kind of a vibration. So I think there is, this is a subject uh, that that, you know, uh, your your uh, your uh, exuberance and charm uh, um, uh, breaks these uh, barriers, and I could, in fact, uh, feel your presence. Uh, you know, there, the, so uh, I was just telling my wife that I was actually moved uh, the moment you came uh, on screen. So I think there is something, some rahasya here, some mystery, uh, which uh, only maybe you or the Lord uh, will will explain. I just want to distill um, my takeaway for in today's discussion. Uh, it is all about compassion and service and uh, Dr. Piramal and, and Dr. Reddy and uh, Mr. Ford. Uh, everybody, I, I think, in their own way mirrors uh, the philosophy uh, that was, uh, was, was told to us by the Bhagavad Gita and our spiritual text. I also quoted the Upanishad and very beautifully explained by, by Radhanath Swami Maharaj. And in this context, you know, we all had the discussion of uh, on, on wisdom. And I came across this amazing um, uh, quote from uh, uh, Reinhold Neighbor, an American theologian who, who is credited with the serenity uh, prayer. And I think it's a very relevant um, uh, prayer in, in these times, you know, where he says that God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I think... Uh, if we can distinguish between what we cannot change and uh, do the things that we can change with uh, hope, gratitude, and faith, I think we can make our own difference in this world. Thank you, uh, Radhanath Swami Maharaj. Thank you, Mr. Ford, Dr. Piramal, Dr. Reddy, for, for joining us and sharing your, your wisdom with us, and uh, Mr. Ganguly and Arthur Forum for bringing us together. I would end by just saying that uh, being a Bengali, and no event is complete without quoting Tagore. So I will end with a quote from Tagore, which I think is very relevant. And he said, I quote, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. Thank you very much. Namaskar, Jai Hind, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Lovely meeting. Yes.